Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 71 of the Stanford MLSS seminar series, of course, partnered with the great CS324 Advances and Foundation Models class uh, this quarter. Today, we're, uh, I'm joined by Avonika and Michael. Say hi, you two. Hello, YouTube. <laughs> uh, and also Ludwig. Um, Ludwig has a, has a great talk prepared to, for us today about a data-centric view on reliable generalization, um, and we're, we're very excited to hear from him. Um, Ludwig is, of course, a professor at the University of Washington, where he's been doing a lot of great work. Um, he did a lot of great work at, uh, in his PhD at Berkeley before that as well. Um, so we're very excited to have him uh, with us today. And Ludwig, go ahead, uh, share your screen and take it away. Cool, thank you. And thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, let's just double check that this works. You see the one slide view, not the two slide view, correct? Yes, looks good. Okay, cool. Then um, you're ready to roll. I'll get started. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining today. I'm going to talk about a data centric view and reliable generalization. So um, I think everyone is on board with this high level motivation that over the past 10 years, we have seen really dramatic progress in machine learning on the research side, lots of progress in various benchmarks. And now the ambition is that we can take this, or for a few years already, the ambition is that we can take this technology and apply it in a wide range of applications in the real world, like transportation, for instance, self driving cars, various healthcare applications like x ray imaging robotics, online content moderation. Of course, in 2023, we also have to add chatbots to this list. And this is all great. I think machine learning will have um, tremendous positive impact in these domains. But one key challenge always when you apply machine learning in the real world is that it needs to be reliable. Okay? And this is obviously a big research field right now, especially at Stanford. There's been a lot of cool work on robustness, distribution shift, and so on. And in this talk, so if I want to take a step back a little bit and around this question, how can we make machine learning reliable? So at a high level, I think there are two approaches to this question. One is, I think this is maybe my, the more traditional one in machine learning, that we look at our training algorithms and our model architectures and so on in order to improve them so that the resulting model, when we train it on a data set, is more robust to distribution shift, is more robust to adversarial examples, and so on. And we've seen a lot of cool progress on that side, but there's also a complementary view to that, that maybe a very promising way forward is also to improve the training data. And so like, maybe we already have really good algorithms and we just need to feed better training data into these algorithms in order to make machine learning more reliable. And so like over the past um, two to three years as I've seen machine learning um, evolve, my shift, um, my view has shifted more to this better training data perspective. And basically what I want to do in this talk today is so like tell you a little bit about this journey um, in the context of computer vision. So we'll start out with a broad overview of the robustness landscape in computer vision as of late 2020, because in early 2021, OpenAI's clip model came out, which made super exciting progress on a wide range of robustness benchmarks that previously looked very, very challenging. And then there's the obvious question, okay, how can we make these models like clip and so on now that they're available even more robust? And the other one, where does all of this robustness even come from in the first place? And this is where this insight comes from. And actually all of the robustness in clip comes from the better pre-training data. And then at the end of the talk, I talk a little bit about sort of like the future directions, what's currently going on in the research world around making better pre-training data sets for image text models. Um, in principle, I really like it when these talks are interactive. I think with the current format, we can't do quite live questions, but at the end of each of these sections, I'll do a brief pause. And if you have any questions, then I think there's like a Discord chat I heard, um, send them there and hopefully we can forward them to me and then I can try to answer some of them. And we'll have the discussion at the end, of course. Okay, cool. So let's dive into the first part, the overview of the robustness landscape and computer vision. And we'll do this in the context of probably my favorite machine learning data set, which is ImageNet. Again, we are at Stanford, at least virtually today, so I think everyone is familiar with ImageNet. I think this is still a very, very useful resource um, because we have built up so much experimental infrastructure knowledge around this data set, which makes it a really rich test bed for um, experimenting with new models, sort of like testing hypotheses and so on. And specifically in the context of robustness, 
Um, ImageNet has also been a very fertile ground for experimentation um, because many people have instantiated this challenge. Hey, how can we make machine learning more robust concretely in the context of ImageNet? Okay, we use this widely used ImageNet test set. Models got better and better over time, but when you deploy these models in the real world, when you apply them on a new test set, often there's a substantial drop in performance and even images that kind of look perfectly fine to a human, the models still get wrong. And in order to make this more rigorous into a sort of like benchmark driven um, evaluation paradigm, various research groups have proposed different out of distribution test sets for ImageNet. So the idea is in all of these test sets, the classes are the same as an ImageNet. So you can take an ImageNet trained model and evaluate them on these OLD test sets. So one example was the first line and the first one is line of work here is ImageNet v2. This is what I did back during my postdoc at UC Berkeley. Um, and then there was a lot of work from various places in this direction as well. ObjectNet is from Josh Tenenbaum's group at MIT. ImageNet Sketch is a nice example from CMU, ImageNet R which also came out of Berkeley. And all of them sort of like tested different kinds of distribution shift in the context of ImageNet. And this obviously is just one way of testing robustness. There's adversarial examples, other kinds of corruptions and so on. And at some point sort of like in 2020, this became a little bit confusing from my perspective because so many different research groups had proposed so many different distribution shifts in the context of ImageNet. And then what we did in this paper here towards the end of my postdoc was to do a very broad evaluation study of distribution shift in computer vision, specifically ImageNet. So like the core object we built in this paper is this big evaluation matrix here. So like um, we have two dimension on the X axis, we have 200 different distribution shifts, 200 different evaluation settings. On the Y axis, we have 200 different models in our test bed. So every cell in this matrix corresponds to evaluating one model in one test condition. Then total, this corresponds to about a billion image evaluations. Nicholas Kalini, one of our collaborators, ran some of that at Google, which was very helpful. And just to give you a flavor of a little bit of what is, what is in this big test bed here, um, let's look at the two axes separately. So on the um, y axis here, the model I mentioned, it's helpful to think of these models in three different categories. The first one is what we call the standard models. These are models that were introduced with the sole purpose of making progress on ImageNet. Nothing specifically about robustness, these classical architectures like AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, and so on. Then the second category of model is what we call a robust model. So this is a ImageNet model where the authors introduced some modification of the model specifically to make it more robust. Think adversarial training, special kinds of data augmentation, special filtering layers, and so on. And then the third kind of model that's going to be important is models trained on more data. So not just the image and training set, but more extra data. Cool. So that's the model I mentioned. What's going on on the x-axis, the distribution shifts. Here we basically, similar as in the model direction, we just try to be as comprehensive as possible and just get everything we could find from GitHub, plug it in this test bed, and then see what happens. So we have distribution shifts like ImageNet v2, ObjectNet, ImageNet R, ImageNet Sketch that I already mentioned, ImageNet A. Then we have a data set that uh, tests for um, robustness in videos, ImageNet with robust. Obviously, we have um, LP, adversarial examples in there, image corruptions like ImageNet C, and so on. Cool. So, like, you could give an entire talk just about this the like test bit here in the different findings. For today, I want to focus on one specific um, phenomenon we found. And in order to do that, we need to set up a specific way of looking at robustness. This is going to be in the form of the following scatter plot. So I go through it step by step because it's going to be a key part of this talk. So what you see here is on the x axis, the accuracy of a model just evaluated on the standard image and test set. On the y axis, same model, but now evaluated on an out of distribution test set like ImageNet v2. And every point in this plot corresponds to one model in our test bed. And to start out with, I have only put in the standard models, which are the blue points. And as I mentioned, they go from AlexNet, so like the seminal paper in the bottom left corner, over VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, and so on, to efficient Net v7, which was state of the art when we did this. That this evaluation. And one thing to note here is already, okay, I've drawn this dashed line y equals x. All the models are below y equals x. So, a perfectly robust model, we would hope is that y equals x. Instead of that, 
perfectly robust behavior. We see a drop in accuracy and a distribution shift. And one thing that's quite noteworthy here is that all of these models follow a very precise linear trend. So why that happens is a very good question. For now, we'll just take this as a given because this is going to be a very useful baseline. So if we assume that, and to the best of our knowledge, this is true, we assume that all the models that are just trained on ImageNet are going to fall on this line. Then if someone tells you, oh, I have a new model here, it gets image and accuracy 72%, you can look at this um, red linear trend here, and then we'll see, okay, the expected accuracy out of distribution ImageNet v2 will be about 58 percentage points. And this is going to tell us whether the model is noteworthy or not. If it gets 58 percentage points, it behaves basically like all the other models we've seen before. So what we would like to see is that a more robust model is above this red baseline here in the scatter plot. Okay, so like, like I, have, I draw, uh, drew a green star here and this is sort of like a, hypothet a hypothetical robust model and the lift above the red, the red line is what we call effective robustness. And the question is sort of like, what kind of training or data interventions give you effective robustness? And so sort of like, just to clarify that this is a good target to aim for, um, in one of our papers at Berkeley, we did an evaluation with five expert human labelers to see where do humans fall on the scatter plots as uh, scatter plot. And they are basically on the y equals x line, maybe one percentage point below the y equals x line. But the reason for the accuracy drop, the main point here is the reason for the accuracy drop is not that the labels in image that v2 are sort of like impossible now because 10% of them are wrong. This is really something the models should be able to do if we aim for human-like generalization. Okay, cool. So this is usually where I pause for any questions about this robustness framework. So I'll just take a slip of water now, and maybe if there's a question, we can talk about it. If not, we will continue. So, yeah, so Ludwig, um, yes. we have a couple of questions from the class. Um, I guess, like, so some, some students are interested about, like, how you sort of, maybe this is taking a step back a little bit, but, like, how you sort of, like, define the working uh, definition of robustness. Uh, we might imagine that, let's say, I don't know, if we completely change the test distribution, surely we would expect we would expect the model to fail. Um, so, is there a good sort of like quantifiable notion? Um, I know you're talking about sort of like this effective robustness here. Um, I guess, yeah, it's like a yeah. quantifiable notion. I think for me, basically, when we talk about robustness in these NLP or computer vision models. Um, it's something where we as humans say, well, it should be possible because I can classify this image, but somehow my model can't. So for, that means that for me, the reference is always, okay, to what extent can a human classify these images in the context of image net and distribution shifts now? So this is why from a robustness perspective, the humans are the right target here. And then basically effective robustness measures how far away we are from this ideal y equals x line. And depending on the data set, maybe y equals x is impossible. Maybe you really have 5% label noise. But in general, we would like to sort of like, if there's this baseline, the red line, we would like to lift the models up. And then we say this is more robust compared to this baseline set of models. Got it. Thanks. Um, and just actually out of curiosity on this, uh, I guess, like a sort of robustness plot. Um, it kind of draws interesting, it's not quite the same, but it draws some interesting parallels to let's say some of like these recent like scaling walls papers, I guess, yep. with like large language models. And uh, when we scale up, let's say the number of parameters, uh, we can sort of like predict, let's say accuracy. And so these like, it's actually, it's super interesting, yeah, how there's such like a very strong linear correlation here. Um, do you have any, is there anything that we can take away from like, are these individual, individual points sort of like also points of like the same, let's say model family, but uh, perhaps scale it up like a ConvNet uh, with many more parameters um, or, yeah. Yeah, these are all super good questions. Thanks a lot. And I'm glad we can talk about them. So first of all, this analogy to scaling noise, I think, is, is a really good one. So, and also maybe this goes back to the previous point, like how do you quantify robustness? Because if you take a very pragmatic perspective here, you could say, well, I don't care about all of this sort of like maybe a little bit more conceptual story Ludwig is telling me. I just care about what gets the highest accuracy of my out of distribution test set. I don't care about a baseline. I just care about the highest accuracy. And this is a pretty reasonable point of view. The problem just is from a research perspective, 
there are so many different models that you could compare to. And the nice thing with this linear trend is we can really separate robustness from your baseline accuracy. So if like I can talk about the robustness of a ResNet 50 modification independently of the baseline accuracy the ResNet 50 gets. I can just see, okay, are we moving up? And maybe they are already models with higher accuracy um, on ImageNet v2. But if we can move the model above the line, something interesting is going on. Because the idea is if we can take that sort of like trick that makes the model move above the line, we should combine that with the state of the art model and then we get something even better. So what I want to do with this definition of effective robustness is decouple in distribution accuracy from robustness and have a notion of robustness that doesn't exactly depend on where you are on the x-axis. Awesome. Um, and I think this is sort of like the analogy also where this is a bit like scaling law. So basically you want a scale invariant notion of robustness. So I can compare the robustness of a model at 60% accuracy with the robustness of a model at 85% accuracy. Uh, thanks. Cool. Excellent questions. Any more or should we continue? I think do you want to ask another or should we continue? We can continue for now. Thanks. Okay, good. We also, I mean, these are great questions. We will take more than 20 minutes for sure, but this is okay, I guess. We can always accelerate at the end. Okay, cool. So this is sort of like the framework of these scatter plots. And like the big question, as I just mentioned, do any of the robustness interventions that people have proposed uh, by 2020 that they actually do the help of this kind of distribution shift? And in order to sort of like measure this empirically, we just ran all 200 models in our testbed now on ImageNet v2, and we plot all of them in this plot. And so maybe the first visual impression here is that this almost looks like the previous plot. There's still a very clean linear trend here, the red line. And basically, all the models are on or very close to that line. And to be a little bit more precise, we have added two kinds of models, the robustness interventions, the brown points, and the models trained with more data, the green points. And basically, especially if you look at the higher accuracy regime, all of the brown points are basically on the red line. So they don't help with the ImageNet v2 distribution shift. The only points that help a little bit, that are a little bit above the um, red line, are the models trained on more data. So I highlighted them here. So on the top right, we have a model from Google trained on 300 million more images, the JFT 300 million data set, which is internal at Google. Then we have a couple models trained at Facebook on 1 billion images from Instagram. And then we have one model trained on ImageNet 21K, sort of like this full version of ImageNet, not just the 2012 competition data set. And just to put this in perspective, ImageNet is 1 million training images. So when we talk about the Instagram 1 billion data set, this is a thousand times more data. And we do get above the red line, but only by one to two percentage points. But it's, it's, it's a gain above the red line. Okay, good. So, so far, so good. Also to be fair to the robustness interventions, they do something for the kind of distribution shift they are designed for. Like for instance, the adversarially robust models, they help on adversarial robustness. The problem is just that they only help narrowly on this one kind of robustness that they are um, specifically designed for. They don't make the model robustly more broadly to real world distribution shifts. Good, but all of this right now is in the context of ImageNet v2. And one sort of concern would be now, okay, maybe this is just this one data set. This is kind of funny. And what's going on on other data sets? So let's look at one more example of a different data set. And this is ObjectNet. So this was built by a different group now. I'm not involved in this or was not involved in this in any way. Still not involved in ObjectNet. I think it's a really nice paper. Basically, what they did was they also wanted to create a distribution shift data set for ImageNet, but now specifically to challenge the ImageNet models. ImageNet v2 had a different motivation originally. We wanted to build a new test set that is very similar to ImageNet. And it turned out even if you do that, the models are still brittle. ObjectNet was, let's take standard objects in ImageNet like a chair, and then let's turn them around in unusual poses, like upside down. Let's put them in unusual positions like a kitchen chair maybe now in the bathroom, that kind of stuff to break some of these correlations that you have in data sets like ImageNet. And I thought, okay, this is great. This is exactly the type of um, data sets we should experiment with. So we took ObjectNet and we plugged it into our test bed. And then we got this scatter plot here. And so if, again, first visual impression is this looks pretty similar to what we've seen before. One big difference now is that if you look at where the dashed line is, Y equals X, this is a much larger drop. So the drop from this distribution shift here is now more like uh, 
45 percentage points, not the 10 percentage points we had in ImageNet V2 earlier. But overall, all the models are still pretty close to a linear trend. And then the only models that are above the red line are again uh, some of the more data models we had just highlighted before. So this model from Google or Facebook that is trained on substantially more data. Cool. And again, um, there are so many more data sets we could talk about now in the interest of sort of like moving forward in the talk here and in the interest of time. Um, I'm just going to tell you briefly that this is not specific to ImageNet classification. Other groups, some of them, or other papers, some of them I've been a co-author on, have looked at similar kind of distribution shift studies in the context of um, imaging, like MRI reconstruction, 60 pose estimation, which is interesting robotics, object detection. And overall, these linear trends under distribution shift are quite common in computer vision problems. And we also look beyond computer vision in um, NLP, for instance, specifically the squad data set, because we're at Stanford today, it would be good to highlight that. We build four distribution shift test sets for squad. And overall, you also get these nice linear trends on the distribution shift. And so like this high level message here also that the robustness interventions don't help that much on the distribution, real world distribution shift is also something other work has figured out since then. So there's this very nice paper in the context of domain generalization. Um, and I'm just going to quote from the abstract here. We conduct expensive experiments using domain bed, which is their new test bed, and find that when carefully implemented, empirical risk minimization shows state of the art performance across all data sets. So, this is a similar story to what we also found that just the standard models, the blue data points, we're doing as well or better than the explicit robustness interventions. Okay, so I think one takeaway here is always um, ERM is actually a really strong baseline. And, um, just FYI, if you're interested in this sort of like linear trends phenomenon, um, we have a paper on that where we do much more in depth studies when it happens, when it doesn't happen. For the purpose of the talk, um, I want to return back to this because sort of like there's two ways of looking at this. On the one hand, we have seen, okay, the more data models are above the red line, but it's overall a pretty small gain, right? It is said that the Instagram models are a thousand times more data. And we only get one to two percentage points. You can use sort of like a silly back of the envelope calculation, and then you will end up at sort of like, oh, in order to close this gap, we'll need 10 to the 10 times more data. And that's just a lot of data. Uh, so the, by, by end of 2020, I was a little bit sort of like skeptical about this and not quite sure where progress will come from. But then OpenAI released their clip model, and they made tremendous progress on all of these benchmarks. Cool. So this is the second part of the talk now. Um, again, I'll take a quick break here for questions. And then we continue. Yeah, so hold on. Lots of lots of uh, student questions. Gotta try to figure out uh, which ones are relevant. So how when did we start time-wise? I'm not fully sure. Why. Okay, we actually we have done. 3.30. Oh, okay. So already 20 minutes. Okay. So let's do maybe like one question. One question. And then we want the discussion at the end. Maybe there's one thing multiple people ask. Or... Sounds good. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, something that's, I guess, timely here is like you mentioned that, okay, among all these different sort of like intervention methods, only more data seem to help. Mm -hmm. But do you have sort of like a quick sense of like um, why we would should, ex or like sort of like what's the criteria for so more data, is there any criteria or is it just- uh, Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Also to be precise about this, it's not just about the quantity of data, it's about the quality in some sense that I would like to be able to pin down more precisely, but currently cannot pin down more precisely. For instance, it's actually a good point. If you just take ImageNet and you subsample the ImageNet training set by a factor two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, 32, natural experiment, um, train, train on ImageNet, but less images, you're moving exactly along this red line. So basically, first, when we saw something is above the line by getting more data, we were excited because we thought, okay, if we train on less data, we'll go below the line, but then we actually moved exactly along the line. So this red line is really a property of your training distribution, not a property of how many samples you have from the distribution. So in order to go above the line, you need a more diverse distribution. For some notion of diverse, that I don't know how to make more precise at the moment. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So let's dive into the second part around CLIP and the robustness findings there. Okay. So CLIP came out in early 2021. Many of you have seen this paper. 
And this is sort of like your first results table in the blog post. And that personally really blew me away because I'd looked at these um, out of distribution test sets for quite a while. First of all, I was super happy that they used exactly our test set for evaluating robustness. And then I was extremely impressed because they do exactly an effective robustness evaluation here. They compare their largest clip VITL to an ImageNet trained ResNet 101. And then they get this plus six percentage point on ImageNet V2, which is half of the drop. And then plus 50 on ImageNet R, plus 40 on ObjectNet, plus 35 on ImageNet Sketch, and plus 74 on ImageNet A. These are very large gains, right? If you follow sort of like the ImageNet related literature, people happily write papers about small single digit gains. Double digit gains are basically unheard of, and then large double digit gains are extremely rare. And so I was like, okay, cool, we do clip now. I need to understand better what's going on here. Because one really interesting thing, um, about the clip paper is that nothing about this model was explicitly designed for robustness, right? Let's just quickly recap um, how clip works. So the training data set is a data set of 400 million image text pairs. So these were collected from the web um, and we have images with associated captions. And then the model architecture here is as follows. You have a text encoder, like a transformer tower. You feed in the caption via the text encoder, gets to some embedding space. You do the same thing with a separate image encoding model for the image side. And then you have the contrast of loss that aims to map matching image text pair embeddings close together. And then if the image and text for pairs, well, sorry, image text pairs that don't belong together, far apart, right? So the classic um, contrast of loss, like we have seen, for instance, in SimClear, but now ported to the multimodal domain. And then they applied a, I guess, sort of like standard large scale machine learning paradigm of training this for a couple of weeks on hundreds of GPUs with a, I guess, by NLP standard small model, by a computer vision standards, a decently sized model with 300 million parameters. Um, cool. Okay, so this is how we train it. And then really, one really cool important feature of it is that it can do what's called zero-shot inference. So now if I have a new um, classification problem, I can just use the actual class names as classification targets. Let's say I want to classify between plane, car, dog, and bird. I just feed those into my text encoder. Now I have an embedding for all of these text strings. And now when a new image comes in, I can just see which of these text embeddings does the image embedding map to the closest. And then I just take the closest text embedding and this is going to be my answer to the classification problem. And this is really powerful because it makes these models flexible to use. You don't first need to create a fine tuning data set. You can just really work with the textual description. And the exciting thing is that um, when you do the zero shot inference, you get this very impressive robustness behavior. So this is the same kind of scatter plot we've looked at before. This is directly out of the clip paper um, in their robustness evaluation, X axis image net as before, Y axis, they just sort of like pragmatically averaged over seven image net out of distribution data sets we've talked about, like image net v2 object net. And then the blue line here is the baseline um, of the image net only trained models. The green points are the prior more data models. And then the orange line is clip zero shot. And you can see it's basically closing half of the robustness gap. And we don't know if you can actually get to Y equals X if you average over all of these seven distribution shifts. So this was a very large step forward. We can ignore the purple line here, but the obvious question here with the orange line is where does all of this robustness come from? And then another sort of like obvious question coming out of this was, What's going on with fine tuning? Because we have another line here, the red line. So the red line is not the baseline anymore. The red line is the linear fit to the clip models that are fine tuned on ImageNet. So they took clip and did last layer fine tuning. And then the following happened that the models get better on ImageNet. Well, I mean, you fine tune on ImageNet, so they should get better, but they actually lose a little bit of robustness in terms of the y-axis. They move down on the y-axis. The hope would be, well, if you fine tune an image net, you sort of like ideally move along the orange line. That's not at all what happens. You're basically moving the right direction on x, but then down on y. And if you do enter and fine tuning, you're actually hurting yourself even more on the y-axis. This is not on this plot. We'll come in a couple of slides, but this was a real problem when clip came out. And we had these models that were good, but not state of the art on image net. When you try to make them state of the art via fine tuning, you actually erase a lot of the robustness. And this was an important insight also 
that put some of these earlier more data results into context, right? We had models that were trained by Facebook on a billion images, but the only way we accessed these models was always after fine-tuning on ImageNet. And it turns out that fine-tuning on ImageNet actually erases a lot of the good robustness properties. The obvious question here is like, can we fix this? Can we get the, get the best of both worlds, both high in distribution and out of distribution accuracy? And the answer is yes. So we wrote a paper on that, robust fine tuning of zero shot models. This was my first paper with UW collaborators, was a lot of fun. And um, people from Columbia, Hong, and also Chong work from OpenAI helped here. Um, cool. And so, if, like the answer to can we do this? <laughs> It's embarrassingly simple. So, right, let's just recap what the problem is. We have the purple line here, zero shot clip models, and you fine tune, you move the right direction on the x axis, but down on the y axis. How can you fix this? And the fix is really just one line, which is you interpolate between the zero shot model and the fine tuned model. And when I say linear interpolation here, I really mean you just take the network weights and you linearly interpolate them together. This was very surprising to me because the whole point of a neural network is that it's a nonlinear model. So why would you linearly interpolate a nonlinear model? There are reasons for that from sort of like the mode connectivity landscape, why this was a good thing to try. Um, Mitchell and Gabriel know this literature in, in very, very well and sort of like got inspiration from there. And this just worked very, very nicely in the sense that like if you do this linear interpolation between the zero shot model and the fine tuned model with interpolation coefficient alpha, then you can trace out the curve here. And the cool thing about this interpolation curve is that it basically first moves up and then left. It's not a direct line between the star and the square, but instead there are these points in the middle that combine the best in distribution of out of distribution accuracy. And like tuning alpha is also not a big problem here. Basically in all of our experiments, alpha 0.5, really just taking half of each model is almost as good as the best possible alpha. Cool. So this was just a sketch to uh, illustrate how this method works. And then this is now the sort of like real data version of these plots. So like we have two fine tuning endpoints, the square and the diamond. The square is for end to end fine tuning. The diamond is for last layer fine tuning. So as I mentioned, if you look at the square, it's actually moving down by more. The end to end fine tuning hurts you more in robustness. But then the good thing is you can do the end to end fine tuning and you get a substantially better interpolation line. So, overall, depending on where you start out as a baseline, the diamond or the square, you get five to nine percentage points on image and distribution shift improvement without losing any in distribution accuracy. And this also, again, works on several other data sets. So, this talk is very image net centric because we have these very rich baselines there and this rich evaluation test bed. But this works the same. And so for 10, um, it gave us the state of the art accuracy on wilds at the time and works on many other data set. We did various extensions of that. One of them is called Model Soups, a follow up paper, where we use this to improve fine training, even ignoring um, robustness. You can, the question is basically why stop at two models? If you can average between two checkpoints, why not just average? three or four or five checkpoints and we call this a model soup and that gave state-of-the-art accuracy on image net and distribution and so if, um, one one nice thing we did recently there was we trained the highest accuracy public clip model so 80 percent zero shot accuracy on on image net so like the checkpoint from OpenAI, the best one gets around 75 76 this is very nice because of this repository that we built, OpenClip, we can now train better clip models than the public checkpoints from OpenAI. Cool. And again, since we want to like not just understand computer vision, but also machine learning more broadly, we are also doing similar kinds of evaluations now in the context of NLP. So here, this is something we did end of last year, 350 different uh, models on 16 different QA data sets x-axis quad as a reference data set, y-axis average over the other 15 data sets. And then you also see these nice linear trends and you also see that zero shot is the most um, robust way of doing inference. And there's again, way more in this paper. Don't have time to talk about this today, unfortunately. So like in the interest of making progress here, but sort of like where does the robustness come from? We will go to part three now, but maybe people have a couple of questions about part two in the meantime. Thank you.
Um, yeah, I guess you can. Yeah, so many there's, there's a ton of ton of activity in the uh, the class Discord chat. Um, I guess so. So one question that people were interested in was trying to disentangle sort of the contributions in robustness um, from Clip. Uh, people yes. noted that sort of like you have sort of like this multimodal type of architecture uh, where yes. you have the text encoder, the image encoder, and you also have the contrastive loss. And so you have like those components, but then you also have, I guess, all this internet scale data. Um, so I guess is there, yeah, like, I don't know, have you looked into sort of, I don't know, ablations or sort of what do yes. you see? Yes, so this is a great question. Thanks. So let's just continue with this because this is exactly what part three is about. It's basically all ablations. So we wrote this paper in order to study very rigorously where does the robustness in clip come from? And the finding is very clear. And this is in, this informed my perspective that data is very important for improving robustness because you can really pin this down and say pretty precisely that all of the effect of robustness comes from the pre-trading distribution. So this is this paper here. It was an ICML last year. Data determines distributional robustness and contrast of language image pre-training. And we did exactly what um, it sounds like the Discord wanted us to do. Um, we just went through a lot of different hypotheses and um, tested them one by one. Let's go through them just to make sure we're all on the same page and cover everything. So the first one is language supervision, obviously. So like standard image and supervised learning, there's nothing multimodal. It's just ImageNet with these categorical labels. Now with Clip, you bring in language. Maybe this gives you a big robustness boost. Actually, I think this was one of the main hypotheses. And um, training distribution, I think, was the other big hypothesis that if we go from ImageNet to this more diverse web crawl pre-training data set, then um, maybe that gives you robustness. I put question marks here because unfortunately the clip training set is actually not public. They released the model checkpoints. We know some things about the training set, but it's not public. Cool. So the next one is the training set size. This could be a reason like 400 million for clip, 1.2 million for um, standard ImageNet supervised learning. I already mentioned though um, earlier that you can subsample or increase your training set size as long as it's the same distribution, you move exactly along the line. So, but just for completeness, I put this here. The loss function, obviously, you also mentioned this contrastive versus supervised is a difference. Um, test time prompting with clip, you can do prompts. And the, actually, like the clip paper has like the set of 80 prompts. So, like, it's not unreasonable to say that maybe all of this comes from really clever prompt engineering or at least some of the robustness, while in image that you just don't have any prompting ability. And then model architecture, you mentioned this earlier already, the best clip models are VITs, most of the models we looked at for ImageNet are confidence. Okay, and so if, um, in the paper, we really go through each of them. In the interest of time here, um, we are going to look at the key experiment for figuring out, the, or for disentangling the effect of language supervision from the effect of um, the training distribution. So like conceptually, how you can think about this is as follows. So like we have two axes here. One axis is the training distribution, ImageNet versus YFCC. The other this axis is whether you do language supervision or not. Okay, and let me just quickly check something here. Okay, we don't have that, good. Um, just for context, what is YFCC? Um, YFCC is the Yahoo Flickr Creative Commons data set. That's an image text data set that's public. And we know that YFCC is a subset of the clip training set. And we also know that YFCC is representative in terms of robustness um, of their overall training set. So they released a subset of YFCC that they used for their overall training pool and said that this is representative for the overall training pool. And based on experiments we did with them, it's indeed representative. So this is why we can compare ImageNet to YFCC, where YFCC is sort of like a proxy for the actual clip training set. Like the other dimension is sort of like a standard classification loss versus the um, clip contrastive loss that's multimodal with uh, vision and language. And so sort of like what we had before our paper is sort of like two quadrants in this two times two grid. ImageNet standard training, obviously lots of models. And then we also started training our own clip models on YFCC. So with, with language and text supervision, sorry, language vision supervision. But obviously, if you want to disentangle that, you want the other two 
parts of the quadrant. So you can do a controlled experiment in very only one direction at a time. And this is what we did in the paper. We do an experiment where we train on image network captions, and we do an experiment where we train on YFCC in a supervised way. And so, sort of like, how do we do this? Let me tell you this a little bit. Um, so, like, um, how did we get captions for image? And so, taking a step back, the perfect experiment here would be if someone gave you the original captions that people wrote as they uploaded their data into the internet and then later people scraped the internet for images to build ImageNet and so on. But all of this connection is lost, right? ImageNet is just the image data set with class labels. We didn't know what the original captions were. And so like, now the question is that if we have ImageNet, where do we get the text data from? And um, there were kind of a couple of different options that we thought about. Um, you could just make templates like a photo of, and then you plug in the class name. That works, but the problem is this is more clean and doesn't correspond to the real language distribution that you see in a data set like YFCC. The next thing would be to run an image capturing model, gives you more diverse captions, but now you have this entire capturing model as a confounder, also not as clean as you would like. You could get new annotations from humans that's closer to true human generated language, but it's also more expensive. And again, not quite perfect because it's not the data that the people originally uploaded. So what we were after was, okay, can we actually get the original text annotations for ImageNet, like the original captions? And the answer is yes, because of like back from the days when we built ImageNet v2, we knew that roughly half of the ImageNet training set actually comes from Flickr. So somewhere on Flickr are these ImageNet images with the captions that people wrote when they uploaded the image to Flickr, we just didn't know how to make the connection. So we so like dove deep into the history of ImageNet and found all of this metadata, some of it did some big sort of like image matching, your stable searching. And basically long story short is that for half a million, so roughly half of the ImageNet training set, we could connect it to the original image in Flickr. So this allowed us to build a new data set that we called ImageNet captions, which is the 500,000 image and images um, with the original captions from Flickr. And then we could train clip models on that to see what is the impact of robustness when you add text annotations to ImageNet. Okay, just to give you a couple of examples from ImageNet captions, well, it's an image, and then there are actually a couple of different text types. There's the title, there's the description, there are user provided tags. All of this is a little bit noisy, but overall corresponding level of quality as YFCC. And then we could do these scatterplot experiments, right? So we have the blue line here, the baseline, which is the image net train models. And we have the purple line, which is the clip models from OpenAI. They have effective robustness. And then the big question is, where do the clip models train on image net captions for? So just for context here, if you train a clip model on YFCC, you do indeed get on the purple line, just in a lower accuracy regime. And then we also trained the clip models on ImageNet captions. And these are the green hexagons here. And the point is that the green hexagons are exactly on the blue line. So adding language supervision to ImageNet gives you no robustness. And we did various sort of like iterations of this experiment. For instance, we also tried using the VITL text tower from clip so that's trained on more text data and using that as an initialization when we trained our image net captions clip models but none of these things help they always stayed on the same effective robustness line as the image that only trained models and so like well, as i mentioned we did more experiments and in the interest of time we can only touch on this one but basically after going all through all of these ablations the only thing that was left was the training distribution. Like for instance, you can do similar kind of population studies for contrastive loss or for model architecture, and none of these things affect robustness. The only thing that matters is the training distribution. Cool. Um, quick check on time. So uh, how, how bad do things look? Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, well, five, five to 15 minutes left. We And this is so like including the Q&A. Yes, including the Q&A. Okay, okay, so we need to, okay, we're going to wrap things up now in a couple of minutes and then we do questions at the end. Okay, so there's the obvious next step now. Can we design better pre-training data sets? This is a paper we had in Neurops last year where we just looked at, okay, how much do different web data sources actually vary in their robustness? Like 
um, we build a library of five different web data sources, Reddit, Shutterstock, YFCC, Lion, Conceptual Captions, Wikipedia, and then did these robust simulations. And basically what you see is it's all over the place. Like these different training sources really vary a lot in the robustness they induce in the clip models when you train a clip model on them. So again, okay, more to say here in the interest of time and sort of like charting out what's next. The obvious question, okay, is first of all, how can you get to a higher accuracy? And the third part of the talk, and just now I showed you these lower accuracy clip models, which are interesting because we have this reliable scaling loss and with effective robustness. But in the end, we want to get to higher accuracy clip models in open source. And in order to do this, um, myself and others from this open source collaboration, Lion, build a large public image text data set. So this is Lion 5B. Um, this is where we trained our state-of-the-art club models on. And this is also where a lot of the recent generative models are trained on, like stable diffusion, for instance, um, was trained on our data set Lion. I think this is also just good to keep in mind when we talk about the importance of data and machine learning, sort of like the common foundation for all of these breakthroughs we talked about, like the much more robust models and this amazing progress in um, text guided image generation. The common thing really is always these large web harvested data sets that make this possible. Cool. And so sort of like in order to do this, we build Lion 5B. And this is great. And we don't have much time. So I, I just pointed to the paper. Um, for how we built this. I think the important part here is that there's still room for improvement because of like when you look at the performance that we get with the Lion trained clip models compared to the clip models trained by OpenAI at the small scale, like a B32 model, we basically matched what OpenAI did. But then as you make the model scale larger, there's this unfortunate phenomenon that um, our data set doesn't scale as well as the OpenAI one. So we have a three percentage point gap at the uh, L14 scale. And there's an obvious question here, can you build a better pre-training set? So just a, so from another recent paper, sort of like a scaling law comparison of the OpenAI pre-training data set, which is the blue line, and then Lion, which is the orange line. And I mean, I think overall it's amazing that we have Lion. It's a super useful resource. But I think overall improving on the data set side is something where there's still a lot of room for improvement. And I have, we have some really exciting stuff cooking, but that's part for another talk because it's not quite done yet. For now, let's conclude so we can get to questions and discussion. And um, yeah, so high level point here is that OpenAI's club model led to very large gains in robustness and image classification. And the main reason for clips robustness is the image distribution. It's not only about the scale. Um, it's not just that they have 400 million images, but there's something inherently about this data set data distribution being more diverse in a way I would like to quantify better, but for now we have to leave it at the somewhat vague diverse. And also just to be fair to language supervision. So like in terms of robustness, I said that the language supervision doesn't, is not responsible for the robustness gains. Overall language supervision for training data is a very, very powerful tool. The only reason I think they could build this much more diverse pre-training set is because CLIP allows you to train on this weekly supervised data with language supervision, because then you don't need to worry about mechanical track anymore. You can just crawl all the data, put it together. CLIP can train on it as long as there's some text associated with the image. I think this is, a, this is actually a really big breakthrough in terms of like how we can train large scale models. Cool. And as we said, the different potential clip data sources differ a lot in the induced robustness. And then I think there's this big question now. I think actually one of the biggest questions in machine learning right now, how can we construct training sets that deal broadly reliable models? I think this is not only in the clip world, but true just as well for the diffusion model world and large language models as well. Cool. So this is all I had. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to learn more about this, um, I've already mentioned a couple of papers throughout the talk, we have our open clip repository for training and evaluating clip models. And then if you like scatter plots now, you can go to robustness.imagenetv2.org and you can make scatter plots corresponding to any entry in our 200 times 200 grid. So you can make on the order of 20,000 scatter plots. So it hopefully keeps you busy for a while. But for now, happy to take questions. Cool. Thank you so much, Ludwig. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop your screen share just so that for the for this part of the discussion, they they can see everybody's faces. Um, I think that that was a really great uh, talk. Thank you so much for coming on. 
Um, obviously, Lion is has led to so many great advancements um, in the past year with stable diffusion and, and all the explosions in those models. Um, I was curious if you have any thoughts kind of on what, uh, what the equivalents kind of look like on the language side, if you've thought about that at all. Um, so one of the things that we hear a lot about kind of in language is kind of these mysterious emergent properties um, that, that come with model scale and, and things of that nature. Um, do you think that, uh, and in your, your, your work, you obviously show that with CLIP, those robustness properties actually had to do more with the data than let's say the architecture or the, um, or according to, to those lines, according to the scale. Do you think that there are, you know, hidden things lurking in the, uh, on the data side in the, uh, in all those language models? Have you thought about that at all and kind of what that could look like? I mean, it's something I'm definitely very much looking forward to exploring more. So if like, in terms of like hidden things lurking, I think we really don't know how much room for improvement there is on the data side. Because I think if you think about it, we have like thousands of papers and thousands of ablation studies for testing all sorts of innovations on the modeling side. Like every paper with a new architecture, that's very nice ablation studies. And we understand sort of like roughly how much are we going to gain by changing the optimizer? How much are we going to gain by adding more layers and so on? And then for training data sets, we have nothing like that, right? It's like training data sets at the moment are sort of more like, here's like hundreds of terabytes of data, have fun. And then um, like we don't have ablation studies for how the different design choices that led to this specific data set affect downstream generalization. I only realized this after working on ImageNet v2, just how many design choices go into making a pre-training data set. And I think exploring that space is going to, I think there is hidden stuff. Like I can tell you concretely, we can already improve over Lion by multiple percentage points. And we have now better models than OpenAI at the same data and model size scale by making improvements on the model size. So there's definitely still room for improvement. This is now the image text world and clip, but my guess would be that similar story holds true for language, but it's something we still need to, need to understand more. Since you mentioned um, emergent phenomena, and this is not directly my area of expertise, I can tell you that sometimes what I hear, I mean, a lot of this is anecdotal, right? It's so like you talk with colleagues and so on. One thing I've heard is that some of the emergent phenomena become more well-behaved plots if you plot them with different metrics, as opposed to maybe accuracy, you plot the log loss or something like that. And then it suddenly looks like less like an S-curve and more like something nicely continuous. So I don't know. I mean, like you tell me if, like to what extent you actually understand that. On the image text side, I have not seen similar sort of like discontinuous behavior. Interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, I know that there, there were a lot of questions in the Discord, so I'm going to turn it over to you for the next few minutes. Um, pick pick uh, whichever ones you'd like, and then we can hopefully get, get some of that discussion in the Discord uh, onto the YouTube. So go ahead, Michael and Ivanka, with, with some of those questions. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so another class curiosity is, I guess, how much Ludwig do you think is in this notion of having this multimodal data versus just uh, having lots of like images or lots of text? Another possible way to phrase this question is like, do you think that this combination of text and images can help, uh, could help with sort of like improving models for also, let's say, language modeling? Um, or do you think sort of, like, and do you think like this combination is like uh, important for let's say improving beyond just say having a very diverse and large amount of image data, or very large uh, diverse amount of like text data? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it also depends a little bit exactly on what are you specifically evaluating? So like for this robustness on these image net test sets, it looks like the language supervision doesn't add any robustness. If you had the same, image pool with categorical labels, you will probably get the same robustness. So we actually did this experiment. So like in the data determinants paper that I talked a little bit about, we have sort of like the other quadrant as well, where we took YFCC, so an image text data set, we threw away all of the text labels, trained only on the images in a self-supervised way. And then you basically get almost all of the effective robustness that you get from clip training on YFCC. Um, yeah, so this is this is one perspective there. Having said that, there are also papers coming out. Actually, a collaborator just shared one yesterday or the day before, where they found that multimodal data did help 
in, this is a different setting now, not the image net robustness shift, but in a different setting, apparently multimodal did help. Um, I think this is something we're still actively figuring out in terms of research, like for what types of downstream problems does the multimodal data maybe help more or less? Um, I think in a, for me, the takeaway with clip concretely is where I look closely that um, it's more important to have a diverse image distribution than to have it multimodal. But being able to train on multimodal data makes it much easier to have the diverse image distribution. Makes sense. Thanks. Um, yeah, are there any YouTube questions? <laughs> All right, uh, I, I will. I'll take the baton back. Um, one one thing I was actually curious. So there there hasn't been a lot of activity on YouTube today. Um, but one thing I was curious about Ludwig is if we kind of take a step back and look at. Um, sort of your broader research agenda. Can you give us a bit of a preview about what's next? I know that you've been busy training lots of open clip models and um, I'm sure we, we have lots of exciting things coming there, um, but what more can we expect, um, you know, a year or, or two years from now? Um, do you think, how much more understanding of the data do you think we'll have? Oh, I think there will definitely be new versions of Lion with improved annotations and better downstream models. So what I would have expected to almost like based on what we are, currently working on, but there's still substantial room of improvement, room for improvement on the data side for multimodal image text models, which will immediately yield to better clip models, but then probably also the next version of stable diffusion is going to be trained on these better pre-training data sets. Now, yeah, I um, at the moment, this is clip focused because we can evaluate clip models very rigorously. And I think that helps in order to like ground all of these experiments nicely, but it's totally um, true that a very big consumer of Lion is um, image generation. And I think on the image generation side, we need maybe a little bit more work on how to evaluate generative models that are text guided. I think once we have that, we'll be able to use this as a guide for better data set design as well. But yeah, one thing that I'm personally really excited about in the next year or two is um, so, yeah, improving the open source machine learning data infrastructure. So the infrastructure is like actually building these large data sets to be trained the models on. Right. Yeah, I I look forward to that too. I I, I love the open source community. It's, it's so welcoming. It's and, super um, fun. And like, I mean, it's been it has been just a total pleasure working with the Lion crew. And uh, I think there's a lot of energy, a lot of cool ideas. Super smart people. So I'm I'm pretty optimistic. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so with that, we were coming near near the end of the hour. So uh, I just want to thank Ludwig again um, for coming on today and giving a really great talk. Um, I think it's it's really great for us to to kind of see the whole the whole view from the the ImageNet v two days up to informing I, I guess informing Lion and OpenClip and and everything. Um, you know, when when you lay it out, kind of the the the, the endpoints and the research. Um, from from A to B is is really clear and um, re really inspiring for for all of us. Um, in terms of the the, the seminar and the class, uh, we'll be back next Wednesday um, with Colin Raffle from UNC and Hugging Face. Um, so he's going to be giving uh, I think a bit of a talk about kind of building ML models like open source software. Um, obviously, something very near and dear to our heart, our hearts, um, and very very relevant to to the talk today. Um, but with that, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. And for now, we'll wave goodbye to YouTube. Bye, YouTube. Cool. Thanks for the invitation. If people have questions, just feel free to email you. Happy to take more questions via email.